I'm Anna Hoffman and welcome to this Data Exposed Exclusive. We are live from the PASS Data Community Summit in Seattle, Washington, and we're here at the Microsoft booth doing some cool theater sessions. I'm joined by Drew. Drew, what are you going to talk about this session? So I'm going to talk about an integration between Azure Functions and Azure SQL, just how we can make either for developers, administrators, it much easier to build on top of what the great solution of Azure SQL is. Cool, awesome. I hear there's also a cool demo, so let's get right into it. So I'm Drew Squires Kabala. I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I am live from the Past Community Summit Expo Hall, where we're going to talk about Azure Functions and the integration to Azure SQL. That's Azure SQL Database, SQL Server, Azure SQL Managed Instance. All of them are compatible with the Azure Functions SQL Bindings and SQL Trigger, which was just released into preview late last week. So. What we talk about it today, you're going to leave here with an example that you can go play with. And one of my favorite parts about Azure Functions is that they support multiple different languages. So whether you are a .NET developer or a Python developer, or you prefer to focus on PowerShell, JavaScript, Java, all of those, you have an opportunity to more easily integrate your Azure SQL database, SQL Server with Azure Functions to either build apps, perform administrative tasks, all of those options are available for you. The example we're talking about is available for you right now at aka.ms slash pass guestbook, all one word. What this is, is an example app where it's a guest book, kind of like back in the day on the internet, you go to a website that have a little guest book where you could leave a little message, it was super cool. This is our app. What this is, it's an Azure static web app and then as a part of that, there's a couple different Azure Functions instances that power different components of that. If you have a website, if you have a website like we have in the bottom left there, it's gonna need some APIs so that it can talk to a database. As a front-end developer, if you're building a website, you might be a little more comfortable with JavaScript. And so that's where JavaScript Azure functions come in. And they can use the exact same SQL bindings as you would when you're building a .NET Azure function. And this allows with less code. So you're reducing that boilerplate code. You don't have to worry about what driver you need to use to write and read from your Azure SQL database. We'll take a look at that code in just a second. But what I want to kind of show about the expansiveness of the ecosystem that's available with Azure Functions is additional components that are a part of this sample app. When an entry gets written, that number one, when an entry gets written into the database, it gets written right in real time, website refreshes, that happens. But part of data is that it's never stagnant. We always want to get meaning from it. Sometimes we need to add additional data or take actions based on the data that's there. And in this case, we understand that when people are entering data, sometimes you want to perform some content moderation, watch out for different things that have entered your community. And here at Past Data Summit, we have a code of conduct and we adhere to making this a welcoming environment for everyone. So we use the SQL trigger that I mentioned was just released a week ago, that any time a change is made to that table, it calls out to a .NET Azure function that performs text analytics and watches out for things like profanity and then flags others for needing further review. And if a comment hits a certain threshold, maybe don't be inspired to test that here at Past Data Community Summit, but if a comment hits a threshold, it actually removes it immediately from view and hides it. So that's kind of where you've got a different .NET Azure function instance running so maybe you've got, like I mentioned, front-end developers. They can build those JavaScript APIs. That's great. But your content moderation team is more comfortable in .NET. Azure Functions are great there, too. Now, I love developers, but they're not the only ones that work with SQL Server. Sometimes there's administration. Maybe sometimes there's kind of care and feeding of your SQL Server estate. And so sometimes, as a SQL administrator, you want to make sure that things are healthy. The SQL trigger itself is based on change tracking. Change tracking is available in a whole host of the different Azure SQL offerings, including SQL Server, Azure SQL Database, and Azure SQL Managed Instance. 
But part of what it does is in the background, it processes the changes and then auto cleans them up after a certain amount of time. Depending on the traffic to your website, if I got everyone in this expo hall to suddenly start entering guestbook entries and it was filling up my database, I might be concerned about the sizes of those tables. So I have a stored procedure that I can run in a PowerShell function to keep an eye on the size of those tables. You could run that on a timer. Azure Functions can run on timers. So you can run that on a timer, have it send you an email or take some automated action. And as a SQL admin, maybe I'm more comfortable in PowerShell and then having a, a T-SQL stored procedure to run based on that. So there's a lot going on in this application, but I promise you, as far as the code that you need to write to integrate with the SQL that you know and love, it's relatively minor. So what I want to touch on here for a moment is I keep saying things like SQL bindings and SQL trigger. What? What? So when you've got Azure Functions, there are these invocable runtimes, whether it's a web request or a timer, like I mentioned, and they're available in all those different languages. But if you've ever tried to develop an app for SQL, you know that you need to grab the .NET driver or you need to grab the Python driver. That can be a little bit of work. So with SQL bindings, they take that, that layer away of all that boilerplate code and they give you an integration point where for an input binding, you're inputting information into the function. So you're creating an object into the function that's a result of a SQL query. So you've written your SQL query, and the SQL bindings integration then puts that query result into your function. An output binding is the opposite. It outputs an object from a function, so you could create an object based on uh, a, uh, the body of a request, and then that gets output from the function into the table, so you're adding a new row to a table. Last but not least, let's talk about the SQL trigger for a moment. I mentioned that it's based on change tracking, and one important part of this is that it sounds like something happens on the database and then the function runs. But to be clear, something happens on the database and the database keeps going. It goes back to work. It's not like, I'm gonna stop and wait. So when we, when we look at the, the diagram here, there's a dotted line the, by number two. It's going back and forth. And it's the function itself watching the SQL table and keeping track of when those changes have come in and making sure that it's processed them all. And you can set those polling intervals. We've got some defaults in there for you to start with, but you're not like having the function slow down your database. That is not just what's happening. So there's all three integration points between Azure Functions and Azure SQL. The example we're gonna talk about today is based in Azure SQL database. One of the reasons why I've based this out of Azure SQL database is that first bullet point right there. I'm building all these different Azure functions. I'm not great at setting up permissions in Azure SQL database and SQL server, but I just want my function to have the permissions that it needs. So in that case, you can use Azure Active Directory Managed Identity. What this means is that I can go into my Azure function right now. I can go into the configuration tab. And I can go to my SQL connection string. This is one of the ones that like is one of the few configuration points. And I'm gonna click to show value. I could open it up and show you because I'm not worried about there being a password in here. It's it's all gonna be authenticating based on the identity of, of the function itself. It's not gonna have a username and password that's gonna get accidentally tossed around somewhere. So that first bullet point is one of the major reasons why I wanted to make sure I was gonna go ahead and integrate with Azure SQL Database because Azure Functions has that great managed identity capability. So I mentioned the configuration point is a connection string and then you're gonna do some T-SQL. You can either use a stored procedure, you could just write your full query or the table name. One thing that I do wanna be clear on is that all of this is in preview right now. The input and the output bindings are available for the full language suite. The trigger is available for .NET right now and we're working to expand it to all the languages. We just, we release at each point that we can to bring value out to developers.
So when I was talking about the trigger and what happens when it runs, I wanted to point out that there's two different recent actions here. And the first one that took 231 milliseconds took a little bit longer than the one that took two milliseconds, which is still pretty quick. And what the difference is, is the first one is the action on data insert. Because change tracking in SQL is going to track a change for inserts, updates, and deletes. In our application, we want to know when data is inserted. We don't need to worry about if it's changed or deleted. So when the change operation is insert, then there's more code that's executed. But if we get a notification that the change is an update, then we're going to skip the rest of the code. We're not going to resend things for content moderation. So you can take very different actions based on what has happened. All right, lots of talking. Let's look at a little bit of code. The development of a demo that has all of these different components, it can take a little bit of time. Most of you that have application estates, you've got all these different pieces that you need to deploy. Every single component, all of those different Azure functions, those can be deployed from pipelines. But the thing is that I can't go without mentioning the SQL is also deployed through a pipeline. So I have a pipeline that's deploying my SQL schema as well. So as I develop the tables and the stored procedures, those are all deployed through SQL action for GitHub and the SQL project that's in that repo as well. So when you grab the sample code, maybe you're not all in on the Azure functions yet, but you see the SQL schema that I've got in source control. I have my two schemas, app and DBO and then files for each of those. So if you have your database and you're thinking, how am I going to get into source control with like the easiest amount of work, the least amount of friction, exporting it into a SQL project and getting that into source control is your one-stop shop. OK. Now, I started this on the premise that we're reducing a lot of code. So where I want to start getting us toward the end here is looking at a little bit of code, and I know that I'm going to be going through different languages, so it's not going to be familiar to everyone. So just bear with me that as we look at our .NET Azure function, the amount of code to do the integration is just a few lines. Everything else in this app is talking to content moderation. It's those function decorators on lines 22 through 24 that define this is the app.entry table you're looking at for changes. And then once I've done content moderation, if I need to write back out, I can update to app.entry and app.moderate. So those are, those, are the, those are the points. I'm not having to like, go, OK, I need SQL client, and I'm going to open up a connection, and then I'm going to write rows. You don't have to do that. I'm just going to put objects into entry updates array. or the moderation array, and then have that update to the database. So this is .NET. I know you're like, oh, well, .NET's easy. Like, obviously, SQL Server works great with .NET. Everybody knows that. OK, I get it. JavaScript. The front page itself, pretty snappy. Yes, hey, Bob Ward. All right, so the. Interface itself is pretty quick. Like Azure Static Web Apps are really lightweight, and we don't want our functions to be slowing that down. And so the add entry and get entry APIs that are JavaScript Azure functions, for example, getting that list, there are two files here. The first one is the function definition. So this is the equivalent of those decorators we saw before. That little block of JSON right there for recent entries is how we define the object that's coming into the function with our SQL information. So when we look at the JavaScript here in a minute, there's going to be a recent entries variable. And when the function runs, it's going to take this select top 10 text entry query and put it in that, and we're done. It's going to have pulled SQL connection string from our app settings, 
and we're all set. I don't have to find the driver, open the connection, run the query, bring the rows, none of that. JavaScript, a recent entries object has the results and it returns them back. It's like unfulfilling how simple it is sometimes. But that's what populates our page here. All right, so we've talked quickly about our content moderation and then the website and those APIs. But sometimes, sometimes PowerShell is the language that we want to use. I mean, it's so comfortable, we use it on our desktop, like let's, let's use it when we're automating things in Azure. And that is why I wanted to show you what also has been recently released, and that is the PowerShell support for SQL bindings and Azure functions. I have two functions defined here. One is the one that runs in the schedule. The other is the other one that I'm gonna invoke on demand, so you believe me. But similarly to the JavaScript one, it's got that JSON function and then a very unfulfilling small file. And it is in that JSON definition where I've got another SQL input binding and it's gonna run a stored procedure. So yeah, stored procedures are pretty cool because you can send parameters into them. And it's nice in automation how we can statically set things and never change them again, right? That's the whole, well, that's not the whole point of automation. You change variables so you can scale up. With SQL bindings, you can pull settings such as parameters from app settings. So I could deploy this function a hundred times and put different app settings in each one for different databases, different connection strings. The report underscore table name app setting is gonna tell me a parameter that I'm sending to the stored procedure. So when I run this stored procedure, all it's gonna do is it's gonna take the results from that stored procedure in my variable change tracking health. It's gonna check something about it, like how many rows am I getting back? Oh, the, the, the value for CT rows, I've got over a million unprocessed rows that I need to do something. So really quick. See how many change tracking rows I have hanging out. And that's the result of my query that's now been pivoted into a response but you can do things with this that you would normally do in PowerShell, like sending an email, or if you have a text messaging notification tied into your PowerShell infrastructure, you can do these kinds of things all from the comfort of PowerShell. So that's what's great about Azure Functions is they give you that flexibility. All of this demo code, including more information about SQL bindings for Azure Functions, is available through the link at aka.ms slash past guestbook. You can also leave a nice message there. If you've gathered since the beginning when I admitted that we want to make sure we have a welcoming environment for everyone, there is content moderation going on, so just go ahead and continue to be nice. The link at the top takes you to the sample code. As a token of the appreciation for you hanging out by the booth right now, there are raffle tickets in the back for the Surface headphones or other prizes that are too difficult for me to read on this ticket right now. So if you head to the back, there will be raffle tickets for you. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions, or if you see me later this week, always love to talk about SQL tools for developers. There you have it. That was super cool. Thanks so much for showing us. Oh, I did have one quick question. What would have happened if I actually had added or someone else added something inappropriate? So if someone had added inappropriate content that violated the code of conduct, the text moderation would have removed it as soon as that trigger would have completed. We saw that 230-ish millisecond execution time there in the log. So it's 
pretty quick that it pulls it right back out and then folks aren't subjected to it. Wow, that's awesome. Super cool. Well, thanks again, Drew, to our viewers online. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, go ahead and give it a like. Check the description. We'll put some links for you to learn more. We hope to see you next time on the next Data Exposed exclusive.